Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? This is America's Outdoor Talk program. Are you ready to get rowdy? Outdoors This Week with your host, Alex Langer. Alex Langer. We've got fishing. Believe me, folks, I have been there, and the fishing has been tremendous. Hiking. Adios. Have a nice trip. Camping. This is a real adventure. How do you know? When you're an experienced woodsman like me, you get a feel for these things. Oh, really? Heck, we've even got kayaking. I'm going to show you kids the time of your life. We've got all the info you need for a safe and fun day in the sun. It's a darn good thing we found you when we did. There's something horrible roaming these woods. And you've got Outdoors This Week. Outdoors This Week. And now, here's your host, Alex Langer. Why, thank you, Mr. Announcer, for that wonderful and rousing introduction like you always give every single week. Except, I think it's on tape, Lynn. That that's why he gives me such a rousing introduction every single time, and it's, it's always the it's same. always perfect. It's always perfect, perfect delivery. It's <laughs> it's easy. It's easy with tape. I know. It's easy with magnetic recording devices. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you who we have with us today. We have a legend of the sport of fishing. He's one of the people that invented modern fishing as we know it, and he's a regular on this show. He's going to be my guest today for the whole hour, and uh, his name is Ron Linden. Now, Ron is one of the guys that started the In Fisherman Network, which is very famous now. It's available on many, many cable systems. The magazine and the the TV show are still active to this very day. Ron reprinted the original book that was given away free back in the early to mid-70s, and I actually got one of the early books, and this book is reprinted with comments in the front and also in the back and also in the margins. It's great to see this book because so many of the, of the concepts that we take for granted these days were first pioneered in this very book. And you can get this book by going to anglingedge.com. That's anglingedge.com. And the name of the book is Catching Fish. The Chronicles That Changed the Face of Angling. It's with Alan Ron Linder and also Bill Binkelman. Now, Bill Binkelman is probably the least known member of the Linder clan. He's a third Linder. He's like the lost Linder. Yeah, it's like Pete Best. He's like, he's a beetle yes. that no, nobody knew about. Exactly. Actually, Bill Binkelman invented structure fishing and the Linders popularized it. So that's the bottom line. They all worked out the basic concepts together and they're in this book and we're going to talk to Ron about it. He's in the middle of writing his second book right now, which he'll be done whenever he's done, folks. That's it. We'll be right back with Ron Linder and all the gang. More of America's favorite outdoor talk program, Outdoors This Week, after these messages. Hi, folks. Ron Linder here for LinderMedia.com, one of the world's most exciting websites. Or you can go see us on Facebook at Angling Edge. Facebook, Facebook, Angling Edge. Either one, or you can watch us on television. We're still playing on some channels. WFN is one if you get that network. We're still playing on some of the channels. Anyway, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. It is learning time, or anomaly time. Better yet, it's anomaly time. Many species of fish in freshwater are called adronomous, which means that they spend most of their life at sea in in the salt water and then swim back to freshwater to spawn. Examples include steelhead, Pacific salmon, striped bass, most of which uh, most folks have heard of. And actually, in places... uh, uh, pl- uh, some areas people have caught uh, fish like the steelhead. Uh, where I live in Minnesota, you go to Lake Superior, you catch them over there. But only one fish in all of our fresh waters is a catadromous fish, and that is the American eel. The female spends most of its life in the freshwater river and then goes out to sea to spawn. Yes, the American eel makes one of the longest spawning migration runs of any fish in all of North America. Uh, After living most of their lives at big rivers here like the Mississippi and others, uh, when spawning time approaches, they swim downstream to join the males at the river mouth. They then swim to a strange place called the Sargasso Sea, which is a whole bunch of weeds, (laughs) which is way out in the middle of the North Atlantic, and that's where they spawn. 
in over a half century, I've been dragging artificial lures and live baits all over North America and even Europe. I have caught one American eel. And that was a two-pounder that came out of the St. Louis River near Duluth, Minnesota, while Lindy rigging with live bait with a nightcrawler for walleyes. And I did that about 25 years ago. I have never bumped into another one since. Uh, just for kicks, I'd like to catch one more uh, uh, one more of these strange, strange critters. And by the way, they're supposed to eat great. At least that's what they say in Europe. That's it for now. And until later, see you later, Alex. Water Underwater, coming up on Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Have you ever wanted to disappear into the woods? Have you ever wanted to tie your own flies, but never taken the time? Have you ever wanted to speak turkey? When you belong at Bass Pro Shops, every week we offer free skills workshops to help you get started. See the store or go to BassPro.com for more information. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. Grab your mast and snorkel and head for the nearest clear freshwater stream and you'll discover a world you never knew existed. Freshwater snorkelers have colorful perch swim right up to their mast. They discover bass and trout hiding under rock ledges and goggle eyes or rock bass under root wads. Neon colored darters swim in the bubbling waters of the stream riffles. Turtles hide in the mud, sucker fish feed on the bottom, and catfish stick their head out of a hole. I've watched crawdads fend off small bass and swam along with water snakes, watched fish build nests and lay eggs. I've observed how each species of fish reacts to both live and artificial baits in which they prefer. I know where to cast because I know where to hang out. As I've snorkeled the clear water, I've found oilers, rings, Civil War bullets, arrowheads, and unique rocks, and it's all there waiting for you to discover in freshwater, underwater. I'm Larry Whiteley, and this is Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Thanks, thanks, Larry. I've been snorkeling underwater myself. I think Larry has been watching me because that's true. A lot of those things you can find underwater. And speaking of underwater, we have a legend with us today, none other than the legendary Ron Lindner. And Ron is not only the uh, co-founder of In Fisherman Communication Network and a contributor to, to Fishing Facts back in the glory days, but they reprinted a book. They were pretty darn faithful, I think, to the format and to the size of the book, even to the paper that was in the original book. First of all, Ron, welcome to the show. Okay, well, glad to be here. It's always great to have you, and tell me about this book. I mean, I remember this book, but not quite like this. Well, uh, yeah, well, first of all, there's 28, 29 uh, additional pages uh, of uh prologue and epilogue and, and some other stuff uh, in order to explain why we did what we did. Inserts in there. Uh, what I, uh, I'm in the process of doing a, a trilogy. It's a, it's a book that's called A Hundred Years uh, in the Sports Fishing World. It's by Al and I, 50 of his years, 50 of mine. Right. And it's, it comes in three parts. And uh, uh, the reason for the three parts, uh, it was uh, divided into years. And the years were 1964 to 1974, 1975 to 1998, uh, uh, 1999 to the present, which that part, uh, the middle one, 1975 to 1998, is called the In Fisherman years. That, those years, uh, the book is probably twice the size of the other one. Really? Yeah, because it incorporates so much more. But in the process of doing the In Fisherman years, I was, uh, every time I try to explain something, uh, you know, to, to throw back earlier, uh, I had to go into lengthy explanations. And I said, for crying out loud, a lot of these explanations were already done in the that old book we did. If we just put that up together... I won't have to go into extensive uh, uh, footnotes and, and, and additional chapters. God, let the folks read. They'll see it for themselves. Why refer to them when they can see it with their own eyes? Because it's there. So we went and we reprinted that book. And uh, that book uh, uh, was written by Al I and the, uh, the infamous, my 
uh, not infamous, but famous Bill Binkelman. Well, t- t- who, t- tell our audience about Bill, because I, I don't think people... Yeah, un- he never got the credit. He never got the credit. No, he never got the credit that he so well deserves. He is not only my mentor, but a mentor of a lot of other... Uh, he's Al's mentor, but a lot of other great fishermen. That he was more responsible for the modern fishing genre than anybody else that I know of. And um, I, in the book, we go into great detail. We explain how the modern angling world uh, came to be, at least it starts in 74. It actually started in that there was an incident in there. I told in, in, uh, it started in 1957, but it really took off in 60, uh, 63, 64. And uh, uh, Bill was absolutely responsible for changing the public's perception of angling. And he wrote in a real funny way. He edited it and put the whole book together. He took a bunch of uh, uh, this, uh, parts that he had in his newspaper, uh, the fishing news. He had uh, First of all, he did the fishing news, and then later he did Fishing Facts magazine. It, the one morphed into the other. And he also wrote a thing called uh, Nightcrawler's uh, uh, Secrets. Then he would a follow-up book, uh, Lo- uh, Walleyes Love uh, Nightcrawlers. By the way, the one or they sold for a buck. If I recall correctly, the one, the Nightcrawler Secrets, it was uh, simply run on a simple press on a simple uh, uh, hard cover with paper. It sold over 100,000 issues. I bought one of those 100,000 copies. And yeah. when we come back, I want to talk to you about that, Ron. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. No. Pay for our time with sponsors. That's right. We got to pay for this time, Ron. This time isn't free. We got to pay for it. All right. But, but that said, we'll be right back with the legendary Ronald Linder himself, brother of Al Linder, and grandfather of the whole Linder clan himself. He's right here, right now. Coast to coast. This is Outdoors This Week with Alex Langer. Papa was a fishing man. Tight Lines with Sammy Lee. Would you like to catch more big bass? Well, like most folks, I would too. Hello, this is Sammy Lee. In just a moment, I'll continue talking with Denny Brower about the flipping method of fishing and how it can improve your catch of big bass. But first, this message. Your best tool for catching big fish isn't even in your tackle box. It's FishMate Pro, the app that loads your smartphone up with everything you need to catch the big ones. You get the best feeding times in the moon phase, plus all your current weather conditions, including barometric pressure and color weather radar. And when you catch your trophy, take a picture on the phone at FishMate Pro interfaces with Facebook and Twitter. Plus, you get recipes, fishing news, and podcasts updated every weekday right in the palm of your hand. Bring more fun to your fishing with the FishMate Pro app. Find out all you need to know at FishMateApp.com. On my last program, former BASS Angler of the Year and winner of the 1998 Bassmasters Classic, Denny Brower, started talking about the flipping method of catching bass, a method of fishing that's a tremendous way to catch lots of bass in the four to eight pound category. Plus, flipping has helped Denny collect over $2 million during his professional tournament career. But while talking with Denny last time, he mentioned flipping and pitching. What's the difference, Denny? Well, flipping is basically a technique where you are keeping the line in your hand and it's a, a set distance. The reel is engaged. The average flip is probably uh, 15 to 18 foot for the average individual. Pitching is just an underhand lob cast where the reel's in a free spool just like it would be in an overhand cast, but it still allows you to keep it low to the water. The only difference between it and flipping is it's an extension of the flip. It gives you more distance, which you need in clear water situations and when the bass are spooky. You've got to stay a little further away from them. When the water's dirty, you can get up close and actually flip, which gives you a little better feel. The closer you are to your fish, the more feel you've got, the, the more accurate you can be with your presentation and the more control you have of getting the fish out of the cover when he bites. So when you have the option, flip. When you don't, stay back off them and pitch. Or if you got a noisy trolling motor, stay back and pitch. <laughs> or cast long distance. That's right. Well, take it from someone who's learned to fish both the flipping and pitching methods. They will put more fish over the side of your boat for you. 
Are your rod and reel imported in flipping? Well, Denny Brower thinks so, and he'll explain why next time. I'm Sammy Lee, and until next time, Tight Lines. Tight Lines, brought to you by FishMate, the ultimate fishing app for your smartphone. By UFP, America's leading maker of brake systems for boat trailers. By SmartBaits, color changes everything. And by Cheyenne Ridge Signature Lodge. Discover why our lodge earned two Beretta Tridents. Thanks, Sammy Lee. And Al Lindner, he was inducted into the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Uh, several years ago, and Sammy inducted him. So it's quite a little club here. I'd like to get into a Hall of Fame. I can't, Ron. You should be in there. I, I should be. You know, you got to have something for the world's best-selling lure of all time. you got to. You know, in fact, I saw a commercial recently on TV, and this guy was called Inventions something or another, and I see the, the, uh, uh, the, the flying lure ad flash up. Are you aware of that? What were they selling, Ron? They weren't selling. Well, they were, you call up uh, inventions that uh, uh, made it big on TV, and they were just uh, flip, flip, flip. They, uh, uh, you'd recognize every one of them. That's probably Kevin Harrington, who was up to his old tricks again. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> not giving credit and just using this stuff, that, right? That's right. He was responsible f- for funding the very first Flying Lure infomercial, and he's had several billion dollars in sales, so I guess he can do it. What am I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but I did, I did see, yes, uh, uh, the Hall of Fame, uh, Al resides in five Hall of Fames, yeah. and uh, he, uh, he's in the, uh, the IGFA, he's in the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame, he's in the uh, Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame as a educator uh, sh- enshrined and as a legendary angler. Uh, and then there's a number of small Minnesota Hall of Fame and uh, Fishing Hall of Fame. Now, if, if I can brag on you, Ron, you're in the Freshwater Hall of Fame yourself, aren't you? Yes, and there's a couple. Of, I'm not as many as he is. He's in two that I am not. The IGFA, he, he, I'm not in that one. And... Uh, I'm not in the bass fishing hall. Well, I'll see if I can pull some strings, and I've got a good lead with the IGFA. Sammy Lee's on the shows. What can be so bad, right? I can charm Sammy into doing uh, just about anything. Lynn, <laughs> Lynn will get you in the bass fishing hall of fame. Well, we got to get you up. I mean, you, <laughs> the biggest, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you introduced selling lures o- over uh, key television. That's the that that is worth something, correct? Yeah, c- correct. It was it was the, it was the first worldwide lure that you know sold hundreds of millions of copies and was all over the world and set all kinds of records and things like that. But but enough about me, Ron. We're okay, here to talk about you. By the way, I want to tell our listeners up there, uh, anglingedge.com, anglingedge.com. If you're interested in seeing the book and purchasing one, uh, by the way, we are uh, autographing. Everyone and they're numbered. I got to send you back this book so you can autograph uh, it. By right. the way, a lot of the promotional copies we sent to writers and stuff, we did not number or sign. <laughs> we will do that. Uh, you are not the first guy we know that says, "Wait a second, Ron." Ron, what's uh, the matter with you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, wait a second. I want to. Yeah, we got a couple back. Already. What's the matter with you, Ron? I have you. I have you on the radio, and and you don't even right, send me right. an autograph book. <laughs> okay, getting back with Bill Binkelman. Yeah, he was responsible. You know, up to that time, uh, if you went to any of the, the fishing books of uh, Sports of Field, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, they called them the big three. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't that much about, about instructive angling. And what was there was, you know, these were of the me and Joe variety well, you know, of, it, of uh, articles. Me and Joe, we went to... This uh, great fishing spot in uh, fly in right. Canada, or we uh, uh, flew down to uh, uh, the Amazon and we fished peacock bass or something. There were were nothing next to home. Right, it Bill was, was from the Midwest, <clears throat> Milwaukee, based, and he uh, he says there are fish in your backyard and you ought to fish them. The general opinion in, 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 in back then was that the, any lake that's near your home and near a populated area is fished out. I once. think that was Bill Binkelman's genius that you guys actually picked up on and, oh, and promoted. absolutely. You opened my eyes, and, and, you know, I set the world on fire, at least at least in my little neck of the woods, you know? Right. You know, uh, Bill wrote, by, and we were criticized 
immensely by it. When you see the book, you'll know why. <clears throat> Bill wrote with bold letters, exclamation points, italics, parentheses, in order to bold, bold letters uh, to uh, emphasize the thought, because he say, you see, everything he was writing was uh, uh, in some way trying to tear down the uh, preconceived notions. Right. right. So uh, he, was, he was always trying to, to, to uh, it was like an argument. <laughs> and m- many people say it when they see the rating, they say, what, what is all this? Uh, any English uh, major will look at this and say, what in the world is this? Plus the word vocabulary. You see, the book you got there broke a lot of the vocabulary of fishing. What today, what we take or what people accept as common right. uh, angling parlance, was being written during those years. Bill was a revolutionary. He was the first revolutionary of fishing, and you guys were were, were part of the gang. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, he sat down with Al and I when he came up and wrote. You know, the book ultimately got me. It, we'll, we'll get that part later. Uh, this this part is in the book. When he comes through with the book, it was originally intended to be a pamphlet given away free. Right. I think I got mine free, actually. Yeah, uh, everybody got it free. When the book was produced, we did about 4,000, 5,000 copies. I forget what it might have been. Maybe 10. I don't know. Let's, it wasn't many. Right. Uh, maybe less than 10. It was intended to be given away at sports shows. Uh, seminars and, and to anybody that requested one through the mail. And we did kind of hype it in the ads and on the TV show. Got a break right now, okay? Hold that thought. We're going to keep them on the edge of the chairs. It's an old radio trick, Ron, that I, I'm teaching you right All now. All right, we'll be back later, folks. <laughs> All right, go take over the show. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, what do you think you're doing? Don't change that dial. Alex will be right back with more of Outdoors This Week after these messages. It takes a whole lot of fishing to do a little bit of catching. It takes a whole lot of fishing to do a little bit of catching. Well, I remember what my grandpa used to say, say, fish hard. A moose hunt in Alaska falls into the high adventure category. Most of Alaska is true wilderness, and moose share their range with grizzly bears, caribou, wolves, and other animals. There's no electricity, no cell phones. It's only the whisper of the wind, the smell of wood smoke, and the excitement of hunting North America's largest antlered game. I'm Wade Bourne, and this is Wired to Hunt Radio. Today, a glimpse of an Alaskan backcountry moose hunt. More Wired to Hunt Radio coming up. Cabela's is the world's foremost outfitter for hunting, fishing, camping, and outdoor gear. They offer more gear than anybody, best selection, prices, and quality, all backed by Cabela's legendary guarantee. Shopping with Cabela's has never been easier or more convenient. You can outfit all your needs through Cabela's catalogs, website, and their many stores. Check them out at Cabela's.com. Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter. Hey, waterfowl hunters, if you need a shotgun for the new season, check out Mossberg's pumps and autoloaders. They come in black synthetic and camo finishes. They shoot three and three and a half inch shells. They offer great dependability and value. Mossberg is America's oldest family owned and operated firearms manufacturer. Check out Mossberg shotguns online at Mossberg.com. Also be watching for the new series of Mossberg Duck Commander shotguns later this fall. Mossberg, built rugged, proudly American. This is Wired to Hunt Radio. I hunted moose in southwest Alaska back in 1985, and when Scott Head and I talked about doing so again, our conversation brought back a lot of memories. Scott directs a group called Sportsman's Alliance for Alaska, and he talked about the beauty of the country, the freshness in the air, the thrill of the wilderness experience. Plus, Scott also brought out one of the practicalities of hunting animals that can weigh close to 2,000 pounds on the hoof. It's a situation where a lot of folks advocate finding a moose along a river drainage and putting it down as close to the water as possible so you do not have to pack that thing much more than absolutely necessary. <laughs> it's, an, it's they're, they're massive animals. And besides moose hunting, which mostly takes place in September in Alaska, 
Scott Head said sportsmen can also experience some terrific fishing this time of year. A lot of times people say that's the best time to go out there and catch those monster rainbow trout, but you could do a nice cast and blast trip if you wanted to do that as well. Um, you know, silver salmon are coming up, perhaps, you know, some late ones are still running, but it's a great, great, great place to be in the fall. Alaska, if you haven't hunted or fished there, indulge yourself at least once, you'll experience one of the greatest outdoor venues in the world. I did, and the memories I have are more than worth the expense it costs to go. And that's today's Wired to Hunt Radio. I'm Wade Bourne saying thanks for listening. Get outside. Thanks, Wade. And we're, we're here with Wade's former boss, Mr. Ron Lindner, who is a legend. Ron is in, he's not in as many halls of fame as his brother Al, but he's at least in two or three. And we're talking about the first of a trilogy of books Al and Ron just released. And it's basically a reprint of a book that introduced many of the concepts in fishing that today seem, today are just taken for granted. It's not the algebra of angling that was, uh, that we uh, explored and expounded on in the end fishermen. What you've seen there is the precursor to it. That particular article was the foundation of what was later to become the, the in fisherman uh, uh, Bible. I think the in fisherman was fish plus location plus presentation equals success. Exactly. If you read that, it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite explain it that way. Right. But it's all there. You could see, uh, and, and the explanations were all there. Uh, that probably was written in about 66, 19, uh, Maybe 65, 66. See, the book is, is a compilation of articles that were written over that 10 year period. Coincidentally, they're not in num uh, 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 numerical order, it, uh, not in the order that they were uh, uh, printed. You know, in other words, uh, 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 that can be, uh, I realize, and we do mention in the prologue there, that can get slightly confusing. There's, there's uh, some articles that are 10 years old later than others right. over there and they're not in one of the earlier ones might be later in the book were these articles all published in fishing news newspaper a lot of them were not all of them okay uh some of them were fresh in the book uh a lot of them were pre-written there and in other places There's a thing called the hunting and fishing news right at that time that was a reprint of a few of those and some other places there were a couple of other publications but uh, uh, most of them were print or uh, run first in Fishing Facts, or Fishing News, actually, but which is a precursor of Fishing Facts. Now, you and Al have these sort of handwritten notes in the margins pointing out things. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, obviously we make one differentiation there. In the theory, uh, original structure theory by, by uh, Buck Perry was that bass, would in summer months would be uh, they they would make migrational runs up on a flat to a to a feeding station, right? And upon the uh, uh, onset of a cold front, they would retreat off this flat. Let's assume that it's a big flat uh, sticking out in the lake and, and with with a drop off. Yeah. And with the onset of a cold front, they would retreat out to what they call a sanctuary. Right, the sanctuary. I remember that. And 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 uh, mostly it would be a rocky inside bend or a point, a rock, a rock laden point beyond the edge of the weed line, and they would all sit there. Right. Now these legendary sanctuaries, these were like the elephant graveyard, something that anybody, everybody would always want to find. There are times when those fish will move out on, on bad weather, will move out to those tips of those rocks. Right. But they, they're not daily movements, and, and, and the routes that they take are somewhat, and we were always looking for the routes. Naturally, if you could find a route, we, like you could find a route for a, a deer that, you know, would set up the cameras. That's where you put your tree stand. So right. we're always looking for routes. Well, we found that not to be exactly true. It is true to an extent under certain conditions that needed to be uh, an in-depth explanation. So uh, we put a note out there that we found later 
that this was not a lot of times what these bass will do if you've got a lot of, a lot of heavy cover or weed cover and you get a real bad front let's say that they'll move out to the heavy weed cover bury themselves on the bottom just shut off and wait for the front to pass so right. that's that's what it was we found this out through cameras radio tracking and uh it was uh, the science a lot of stuff he he did notice so held up under scrutiny right. you know that was one of the things that the sanctuary theory did not exactly hold up well, well after he, a lot of it buck had it right more of the time than he, than he had oh yeah a lot had more wrong. of the time and of course you know he uh he was a troller mostly yeah. he did not he was not a big time caster he wasn't afraid to cast but he was not a caster he was a troller the reason he cast he trolled well, he used to map and he had these right. lures that ran at certain depths. And remember, we did not have maps or depth finders at that time. The depth finder came just at the time that he was really pushing and was the marriage of the depth finder with his theories of structure uh, uh, that could popularize with Bill Binkelman's uh, uh, writings that put it all together. Run, run. we got to hold it right there. We're out of time. we, we got to have you back to talk about the rest of the book and, and also the rest of the books in the trilogy, which we right. never... Which AnglingEdge.com, remember all right, that. <laughs> go to, folks, go to AnglingEdge.com. You can see and hear Ron and Al and their wisdom. Ron, thanks a lot for being with us. All right. All right, folks, thanks for being with us. We'll be back next time on Outdoors This Week. Bye-bye. Alex Langer, Outdoors This Week.